Well, uh, let me invite you to turn uh, in your Bibles, if you brought your Bibles, to uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 uh, through 27. It will also be uh, behind me uh, if uh, you're not able to um, access a Bible this morning. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 uh, through 27. And uh, this is uh, the very end of uh, the Sermon on the Mount. It's a, almost a summary uh, passage as uh, Jesus concludes uh, his uh, Sermon on the Mount. And in next year, starting in January, we'll be walking through uh, the entirety of uh, that passage. So we'll come back to this uh, as well uh, at some point next year. But I did want uh, to use this as uh, our text uh, for today. Jesus says this, Therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat that house, and it fell with a great crash. If you've ever driven down 95 South, let's say you're going on vacation or returning home, if you're from that area, perhaps you're going to Charleston or somewhere in uh, Georgia or that great mecca called Disney uh, in Orlando, as you get through uh, Richmond and you start to get into Southern Virginia, you'll move into North Carolina and you'll start seeing advertisements for this most extraordinary destination that you really need to, to stop at. And you'll see signs, and it promises that this is a destination among all destinations. And even as you see all these signs, you're tempted to say, Honey, instead of going to Disney, or instead of going to Hilton Head, or Charleston, or Savannah, or one of those great places in the southeast, maybe we should spend our entire week at this place, because these signs say this is the destination. Now, if you've ever driven down 95 South, you know that I am talking about a place called South of the Border. Yes, okay, some of you have been to South of the Border. And if you've ever been to the South of the Border, you know that it's nothing more than a dime store on steroids with a cheap hotel and a few carnival rides thrown in. It is the quintessential tourist trap. It is an illusion that essentially over-promises and under-delivers. Illusions. Jesus wrapped up the entire Sermon on the Mount by saying that some people build their lives on illusions. Their illusions of being self-sufficient or in complete control of their own destination or their own journey, captains of their own destiny, in control of their security and things that may happen in life. And lives are built on illusions of power, popularity, maybe wealth and influence. But these pursuits overpromise and they under deliver. They don't hold and they don't sustain when the rains come down and the winds start to blow in our lives. Power wanes. Just ask any former official in this town how much power wanes. Popularity is fickle. Treasures on earth rust and decay. There are illusions that overpromise, and they under deliver. Another example, if you've ever been to the Outer Banks and if you've ever driven along Highway 12, you will notice that there are several homes on Highway 12 that are slipping into the ocean and there's nothing that can be done anymore. That these homes are beyond rescue The tide has come and the tide takes these homes away day by day, week by week, and month by month. The owners thought that they had built on solid ground, but it was an illusion. Well, today we continue our series called Life at Downtown, and we're taking a look at core values to which we are committed here as a family of faith. Now, keep in mind, we don't claim to keep these core values with perfection. We don't claim that 
We ma have mastered all four of these. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. We're all pilgrims on a journey. We're all seeking to know and to be like Jesus Christ more and more each day. But that does not keep us from aspiring to live out these values in our lives. I was talking with Dave earlier this week and, and he was sharing how some people criticize Christians because we don't always live out completely and perfectly the scriptures or we don't live out completely and perfectly our values. And he shared with me this fascinating insight that when someone says to him something like that, his response is, well, of course, that's why we worship Jesus because he did. <laughs> I mean, that's why we worship Jesus. He did live these out perfectly and completely. He was the only sinless one, but it doesn't keep us from aspiring to be more and more like him. So today we consider the value of what it means to be authentically biblical. Jesus said, if we listen to him and if we put his words into practice, then our life will not be built on an illusion but rather they will be built on solid ground. They will be built on solid rock, as the old hymn tells us. Now, my sense is there's a month worth of sermons in each one of these values. And we're going to talk about the role of Scripture in the life of the community of faith uh, over the weeks and months and years that we journey together. So today is a little more of an overview. But I'd like to start with a summary statement about the role of the Bible here at DBC. The teaching of God's Word permeates the life of DBC. The Bible is God's Word to us and must be applied in how we believe and behave toward God and one another. Let me say that again. The teaching of God's word permeates the life of DBC. The Bible is God's word to us and must be applied in how we believe and behave toward God and others. Now, notice in that statement that that statement goes beyond how we view the Bible and the nature of the Bible. And that statement goes to the point of we not only believe that it is God's revealed word to humankind, but that we should live the Bible that is relevant for today, and it matters in our daily lives. I mean, being authentically biblical means that we turn to Scripture as a congregation for direction, as we relate to our, our friends and neighbors around us as a community of faith. It means we do so with the values of Scripture. As we plan ministry initiatives in this new season of ministry, we do so based on the purposes of God's church as we discover in scripture, on Sunday mornings, in Sunday school, and, and in worship, and in small groups throughout the area, we ground these studies in the word of God. When surprises come our way, when trials and disappointments, we seek to respond in the way that we've been taught in God's word. Conversely, to be inauthentically biblical would be to hear the words of scripture but not put them into practice. To hear them, but not put them into practice. I heard a story about a woman who bought a passport to go on a trip and at the last minute she had to cancel her trip and she never took the trip, but she carried the passport around in her purse for 34 years. Imagine that, even after it expired, she carried it around, but she was never able to take the trip. Well, we, we have the word of God given to us, God's gift to us revealed here. And it's important that we not just carry it around, that we not just have it on an iPad or, or we have it uh, on uh, the, the, the hard copy, if you will, but that we live it out and we put it into practice. So let's spend a few moments what it looks like to be authentically biblical. Just a few examples, and we'll build on this over weeks and months to come. One way that it reminds us, or one example of what it means to be authentically biblical, it means that your foundation will last forever. If you ground your life on the Word of God and in the Word of God, being Jesus, then your foundation will last forever. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. 
It's interesting, some words of wisdom or advice fade over time and they're no longer applicable. If you go to a local bookstore, you will see hundreds, if not thousands of books uh, seeking to give you advice about every single area of life. Uh, Take nutrition. You can find a book that will say you should eat low carbs and it doesn't matter how much fat you eat. Or you'll find another book that says uh, you can eat high fat but make sure, or, or no fat and high carbs or however I just mix that up. And then some will even say, just don't eat at all. You'll lose weight that way, I guarantee you. But the point is, their advice fades. Some say coffee's bad for you. Some say coffee's good for you. I hope it's good for you. I'm going to hedge on that one. (laughs) But advice fades over time, but not the word of God. The word of God has an eternal quality to it because it points us to Jesus who is the word. John tells us that he was the, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And that one of the great images of Jesus is as the actual word of God. As we enter the relationship with Christ, we find our rescue for here and for all eternity. And so it has an eternal foundation because it points us to a relationship with Jesus. Now let me make sure to draw this distinction. As we come to Christ, as we're in relationship with him as his disciple, our relationship is not with this book. This book is not the, the fourth member of the Trinity or the Godhead. Our relationship is to the Christ to whom this book points. I love the beginning of the letter of Hebrews in the New Testament where it says that in the past God spoke through his prophets but now God has spoken through his son who is the exact representation of his being and who holds all things together by his word. This book provides for us a foundation for our life because this book leads our lives to be grounded in the person of Jesus who is the way who is the life, who is the truth. One scholar wrote, our authority then is the sovereign triune God revealed in Jesus Christ, communicated through his inspired word and confirmed by the Holy Spirit in Christian experience. I love that last phrase. Confirmed by the Holy Spirit in Christian experience. You know what that means? It means for years, and decades, and centuries, and for over 2,000 years, people have been turning to Christ as revealed in Scripture. The saints of old have been turning to Christ as revealed in Scripture, and they have found Scripture to be trustworthy by experience over the years and years and years. I saw this eternal quality to the Bible's foundation a few days ago. I, I mentioned to you, I think the, the first week that I was with you, that my mom and stepdad just celebrated 50 years of marriage. And four years ago, my mom had a major stroke, and my 83-year-old stepdad has been taking care of her ever since. And at the beginning of uh, that journey, my mom was, was living at home, and she was mobile, and uh, it was, uh, according to my stepdad, a joy Uh, to have her home and to be able to be with her every day in the home. It was also a lot of hard work as he took care of all the caregiving. All of a sudden, this 83-year-old man is doing laundry for the first time and and cooking for the first time and all that. Well, a year and a half ago, uh, my mom fell and ended up having to go to a nursing home. And now she's deteriorated to such a point that she uh, no longer can walk and she can no longer communicate through uh, talking at least, and she can't feed herself. Three times a day, my stepdad drives to the nursing home and he feeds my mother her breakfast, her lunch, and her dinner because he is just convinced, first of all, that the people at the nursing home won't feed her the way he can. And at first, you know, he might be right. And he's convinced that she needs to eat in order to stay alive. And he's right there too. But I will tell you, it is taxing and it is tiring. And he is tired. And occasionally when I visit my mom and and get a chance to sit with him in the sunroom there just outside Greensboro, occasionally he will sit and he will start asking me why. Why did God allow this? 
why did God allow my mother, who has, was a saint and just raised beautiful children, <laughs> why did God allow this to happen to her? And he's even asked, why did God keep her here and have her suffer like this? And we sit and we rock and we sit and we rock. And we admit that we don't know exactly all the ways of the Lord, but we know that his ways are higher than our ways. A couple of days ago, we visited as we took my, our son to Columbia for his last year of college. And we stopped there in Greensboro on the way home. And we had a great visit. And my dad had retired to go to his room uh, to read and to watch a little TV. And my sister called and I had to give a message to him. And I went in, knocked on the door and opened the door. And I went in and he was doing what he does every single night and every single morning. He was reading. He was reading from the pages of scripture. He was turning to his rock and he was turning to his rest, refuge. And even though he struggled, even though the winds have blown, even though the rains have come falling, his life is on solid ground because he has based his life on the person of Jesus, his rock, and his refuge. It is a powerful, powerful example. If you base your life on the foundation of Christ as revealed in Scripture, it will last for all eternity. It is not an illusion. It also means, authentically biblical, also means that the Bible shapes your framework for life. It's interesting that we often, we talk about the Word of God as a powerful foundation, but it's interesting the only time that we really think about a foundation it's either when we're pouring a foundation when we're building something or the only other time we think about a foundation is when something has gone terribly wrong with the foundation, right? Otherwise, we don't think about it. That when we, when we look at a house, we don't look at a beautiful house and say, oh, wow, must have a great foundation, right, Ed? No, we look and say it's got beautiful walls and a beautiful roof and furniture and carpet. We look at all the exterior things that the eye can see. Well, what's so wonderful about God's word is that it lays this incredible foundation for us. But as we submit our lives to it under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, it also then lays up and places up, raises up a framework for our life that other people see and that God sees. And it's our great desire that the exterior of our lives, because we've based our lives on the word of God, it's our great desire that they continue to look more and more like Jesus. And what does the disciples look like? What does the disciples' life look like that has God's word as a foundation? Well, one example is we live as, as three-directional people or 3D. We're three-dimensional. We're the first three-dimensional people long before all the science fiction and stuff. We live up, up toward God in worship. Every aspect of our life is meant to be an act and an offering of worship to God. We live in toward the family of faith. We, we need each other to grow in our relationship with Christ. We can't pull away from each other if we want to grow and, and live like the Lord wants us to live. And we live out on mission in the world. We live in three different directions. It also means, with the Bible as our framework, it means that we live as teachable people who are guided by the Lord. People who have trusting spirits. A few years ago, Jody and I took the kids on a hike on the Appalachian Trail, and we didn't take a, a real difficult hike that would require an expert guide, but we took an intermediate hike. And it was a, a great time. We had a wonderful time seeing all the views, but there was a couple of sections of the trail that got really narrow and really tight, and it, we weren't quite sure which direction to go at a couple of places. We could have gone one way or the other. And actually, a couple of times, my instinct led me to go one way. But then I thought, and then I looked, and I had to look around really close, and then I all of a sudden saw the yellow mark on the tree. Now, on the Appalachian Trail, the, the folks who know the trail, they've put yellow marks on certain trees. Sometimes they're hard to see, but those yellow marks will take you on the trail and ultimately get you to safety. So a couple times as we face these forks in the road, what would I do? Would I follow my natural instincts? And my natural instinct said to go one way. And then my DNA as a man said, don't listen to direction from anybody. Just go my way anyway. 
Or am I going to follow the people who came out with yellow spray cans and painted these trees? Well, we followed the people who painted the trees because we figured they knew a little more about the trail than we did. And it led us to safety. Sometimes in our lives, we may think we have the answers. Our instincts may lead us in a certain direction, our natural instincts. But we need to know that there are times our natural instincts will betray us. And as God's people, we have to follow our spiritual guide. We have to follow the Holy Spirit. And we have to realize that the Spirit will often lead us in ways that may be different. And as people who seek to live authentically biblical, guided by the word of God, we seek to align our lives to it even when our instincts might tell us differently. Even when our instincts might tell us differently. It may seem like the unknown path. Our instincts may tell us to hold a grudge But the unknown path, the way of the Lord, is to release that grudge and to forgive and release bitterness. Our instincts may tell us, don't worry about loving someone who has a different value system than we do. But the unknown path of the Lord is to love, and he will lead us constantly to love, even people who are hostile toward us. Your instinct may tell you to play it safe. But the path of the Lord will say, step out in faith. The Bible will very often, guided by the Holy Spirit, lead you to the road less traveled than the world around you. The Bible shapes the framework of our lives also in that it puts us on a sense of course correction. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. When we take the wrong path in life, and anybody ever taken the wrong path before? I mean, I have. When we take the wrong path in life, we can turn to the pages of scripture and with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, find conviction and correction to return to the path that God has for us. Or, Scripture may also lead us to strengthen an area of our lives where our foundation may be undeveloped or our foundation has become weakened. In other words, it trains us in the ways of righteousness. There may be areas of your life that you've never released into the Lord's hands and you need Scripture to come in and to provide that strong foundation for you and train you in that area of righteousness. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that Ten Norton is out of commission for a while. Uh, one of the issues we discovered this past week is that the foundation has eroded under the kitchen and under the uh, downstairs bathroom. In other words, there's the floor and no more. Okay, that's just basically what, what it's like. And if, I don't even know if I should give you tours of it now because they probably it's not safe. But anyway, there's a floor and no more. It's eroded. And so what we're going to need to do is, is get some people who, who, uh, who know about floors that erode and engineers and stuff. And they're going to have to come in and they're going to have to strengthen the foundation. They're going to have to lay uh, concrete. They're going to have to do it all again so that it is firm and it is solid under there. As you look at the, the, the uh, foundation of your life, There may be rooms in your house that are just good and fine. But there may be rooms in your house that need a strong foundation like the word of God. Your marriage may need a stronger foundation. Your parenting may need a stronger foundation. Your finances may need a stronger foundation. The way you relate to people, where you live, where you work, where you play may need a stronger foundation foundation, as you submit your life to the totality of God's word, as you submit all of who you are under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he will strengthen the foundation of your entire life. Lastly, and again, this is not exhaustive today, but the Spirit uses the Bible to bring about change in our lives, to mature us and to grow us up. I I love how St. Paul refers to the continuum of his whole teaching He says there's the continuum from milk all the way to meat. Now, little Lindy, we saw uh, her picture. She's a week old. She's not going to have a ribeye for lunch, is she? I mean, she's not ready for that. 
But one day, she's going to say to Dan and Audra, let's go out and get a steak or something. When babies are born, they feed on milk, but later they need solid food. Here at DBC, we want to provide Bible studies for people who are all across the spectrum of faith. If you're not yet a Christian, we welcome you here. We're glad you're here. Kick the tires of Christianity. We want to help you pour over Scripture. We want to help you discover this Jesus to whom we have committed our lives. And we want to help you research the Scriptures and come to a place of faith in Christ. You may be here today and you're a brand new follower of Jesus and you've never studied the Bible. And you, you, just, you just struggle with it. We want to help you with 101, 101 type Bible studies where you can start and learn to grow in your faith through Scripture. You may be here and you're a mature follower of Jesus and your desire is to keep growing in maturity in Him. We all have something to learn from the pages of Scripture. To be authentically biblical means that we come to Scripture and we say that we don't know, we don't have all the answers that we all need to learn something. We come with humility as we approach God's Word. We all have something to learn, including yours truly. I will make a confession to you. There will be times when I'm not sure where some of the smaller books in the Bible are, like Habakkuk or something like that, and I'll look like I know where I'm going, okay? I'm just going to confess it to you right now. That's why I use an iPad. I just punch and there it is, but... Anyway, we all have something to learn from the pages of Scripture. When I teach on Sundays, it is my hope that I have something to say for everybody along the spectrum. Some Sundays will hit somebody on a different part of the spectrum than others. But I want you to know that I know there are people from all over the points. And it's my great desire that we take next steps to grow in our faith. Let me say one last thing about this idea of growing and changing as we encounter God's Word. And that is the role of personal Bible study. The very, very best way for you to grow in the guidance of Scripture is this incredible blend between group Bible studies like we're doing right here and like you do in Sunday school or, or, or small groups, but also as you encounter the living God in the pages of Scripture, when you just open it up, you alone with the Lord. Here at DBC, we want to help you learn how to study the Bible on your own so that you can engage in daily nourishment from God's Word. I, there's a sign at the entrance of Yellowstone National Park that says, please don't feed the bears. Has anybody ever seen that sign? It's, it's, please don't feed the bears. But yet, as you drive through Yellowstone National Park, you will see that some people try to feed the bears. What you don't see is that each year park employees have to remove the dead carcasses from bears who have stopped learning how to feed themselves. They've lost the instinct to feed themselves and they die of starvation. If the totality of your experience with the Word of God is only when you're with the people of God and not on your own in personal Bible study, you may lose the instinct and the thirst to turn to Scripture, to be nourished by God on your own in personal Bible study. It's something we all need to develop in order to grow stronger. So, to live authentically biblical means that you have the Bible, the Christ revealed from the Bible as an eternal foundation. It means that your life will continue to grow and to be framed out in such a way that you reflect the character and the nature of Jesus. And it means that you'll just grow and you'll be a lifelong learner all the way until the Lord calls you home. In, in Nags Head, North Carolina, there on the Outer Banks, was this incredible vacation place. In the 30s when it opened, families would come and they would just have a great time there uh, in Nags Head. And all the way through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and even 70s, it was just a great place to go for a vacation. Well, in the 80s, it fell in uh, disrepair through different owners, and it also was threatened by the encroaching Atlantic Ocean. 
And so it wouldn't be long if something wasn't done. It wouldn't be long before First Colony Inn, that great national historic landmark in the Outer Banks, would look just like that house I showed you earlier. It would start falling into the ocean. Well, new owners bought it, and they endured amazing obstacles, but they finally did something incredibly radical. They went, they bought it, they got all the permissions from the uh, county and the area, and then they carefully divided the house in three temporarily. They loaded it up on trucks, and they moved it three miles south to a place with a much stronger foundation. Something radical had to be done. It had to make a move. What about your life? What about your life? Is your life on a firm foundation? Do you have Jesus and his word as the foundation of your life or is it built on an illusion? Are you putting your trust, your hopes, your dreams in that which will crumble over time. My hope and prayer is that you will build your house on our Lord and his word. And if you haven't, that you will allow him to move you to a firm foundation in him. All God's people said, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that in you and because of you that our lives can be placed on a firm and a solid foundation. Lord, our marriages can be on a strong foundation. Our children, our grandchildren can be on a strong foundation. Lord, the way that we live for you in the workplace, the way that we live for you in the neighborhood can be on a strong foundation. Lord, the way that we respond when the rains come and the winds blow can be such a way because of you that we will not fall. But it's only because of you. And so we thank you for your promise that when we hide our lives in the cleft of the rock, that we will endure anything that this world and that life may bring our way. Lord, we confess to you there are times when we let the worries and the cares and the struggles and the anxieties of life just pelt us like a cold driving rain. They cause us to shrink at times. They cause us to wonder. They cause us to weeble and they cause us to wobble. But Lord, remind us as we sink our lives completely and fully into you, that you've got us and that you will not let us fall. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for Jesus. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Dave is going to lead us in, in our closing song, after which, uh, if you have a commitment that you would like to share, maybe you want to, to come and learn more about faith, or maybe you want to come and renew your faith. Maybe you want to come and be a part of this church by joining us in membership. I'm going to be standing over here to the right. Uh, I just want to encourage you to come and talk with me after our final prayer. I'd love to hear what God is doing in your life. Let's stand together and sing.